I was born in Manchester, England. Mother and father, my father was from Ireland. My, my father worked for an iron company and he rode his bicycle every day because we had no transportation at that point in time. And mother just was a housewife. I don't say just was a housewife, but she was. And my grandmother lived with us. I am pleased that I have remembered all the details that you want to know. Yeah. And I, I've lived there. So that's why these ladies wanted me to talk to them. Because very few, they hear about the children being evacuated, but they never met anyone that had actually been. And I was one of them. So if anybody can speak clearly, then it's me. And we had bombs every night at 6.30. The Germans would come right over our house and go right for the munition factory which was 25 miles away and they do all what they could damage to the munitions factory but the strangest thing of it all was we we had lived in a cul-de-sac if you know what that is there's no you can't drive through to it or anything and we were the beginning of eight houses and row houses so our house was the first house of that row okay and then there were another row and another row and another row for eight rows of the Germans would come over and start dropping the incendiary bombs. And the incendiary bombs would come in on the roofs of people's homes and ruin their beds and their sheets and their clothes, everything. They never, they didn't start with us apparently because we never had any damage at all. We never had anything that came and destructed our house in any way, not even the back of the house. So the good Lord was watching over us for sure because we were safe. And the fact that I think it was that they didn't start to drop the bums until they, this, there was a church steeple at the end of where we lived, and maybe that was their spot to start bombing. Government had decided that our children should be safe. Right. Fine. Sounds wonderful. Right. But what good is that if when we got home, eventually, our parents might have been killed with the bombs? Yeah. That would have been awful. We'd have been orphans. Thank God it wasn't that. So it was a happen. government decided all children under a certain age go. They decided that we should be safe. Yeah. Filed onto the train all together. Wow. And then as the train stopped in the town, they were all shuttled off and each person went to wherever they were supposed to go and that was all we knew about them. So unless we went and investigated, like I went to see who was next door to me, you know, you didn't really have any access to anybody else, you know. So you might meet them on the street or in the playground, in the school or whatever, but mostly we didn't see many children that we grew up with that was on the train, you know, until we eventually all got away from it all. But, you know, when I think back about that, you know, I could have been an orphan. That would have been even ter more terrible, mm -hmm. you know, but thank God it didn't work that way. Yeah. So all told, as I said, we all given numbers. NTWD was my number, and I don't know what everybody else's was, but I remembered that. <laughs> and the reason I remembered that was just silly. Uh, NTWD, my last name was Winifred Delaney then, before I married my husband. And so therefore, NT said nighttime Winifred Delaney. So I remembered it that way. I went to Accrington and a little tiny church, a, a town called Church, which was just outside of Accrington. And then that's the start of the process. We were up, driven up the road and uh, I was billeted with a Mrs. Wally and she lived on Dill Hall Lane and um, she was a neat little person I would say but she pointed it out to me as soon as I arrived she baked bread once a week and the, that one loaf of bread is yours for the week so I thought well this isn't going to be too exciting so then <laughs> her story became really very very upsetting no, that I didn't know about. So one day I went out to the next school, next house next to me to see who was in there from my school because we didn't know who was billeting where, you know. So I get up there and this lady said to me, where are you living? I said, I'm living with Mrs. Wally, who was next door to her. Oh, she said, that's where the little girl got her arms chopped off from her elbows. Uh, and you can imagine a 10-year-old child receiving that thought. I thought, what? Whew, it just kind of threw me for a loop. But my mother always said, you know, don't, you know, take, 
stand on your own two feet and take it all with your a grin or whatever and just take it. So I did. I didn't ask any questions. There was nothing I could ask about that. The woman had already stated the fact. So when I went back to Mrs. Wally, she said, somebody's been talking to you, hasn't they? I said, yes, they have. What does she say? And I told her. She said, that's exactly what happened. But anyhow, she had this daughter playing on the floor. The father comes in in a drunken stupor and has an ax of whatever he's got in his hand, and he chops the little girl's arms off from the elbows. Oh, my God. You know, we were pretty tough kids, that's all I can tell you. I really do. There was no crying, yelling, screaming, like everybody goes, falls apart. I don't remember seeing anybody do that, and we should have really been doing that. But we were so stunned by the whole thing, and so sorry to leave our parents, and we all loved our parents so much. We really were a close-knit family, and all of the children, I'm sure, felt the same way. But when I was away from home, it was at least a, 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 one month and maybe two. It wasn't much longer than that, but long enough to make you feel, oh, I want to go home. My grandmother said when she <laughs> saw me, she said, oh, that child is hungry. And I was, because I didn't get chicken, I didn't have roast anything, I was just, you know, uh, I don't know how, I, I really to this day don't know how I became st strong. But thankfully, we were all came back and we were all safe. But it could have been so much the opposite. When the train came and took us back home, oh, God. If anybody should be cheering, it was us, and we were just thrilled. When you got back home, had the, had the air raids ended by then? P pretty much so. They give up because they had done all the damage that in our area. Now, of course, that's only one big city, Manchester, a pretty large area. And then, of course, they were in London and all the other places, too. But that factory, that munitions factory, is what they wanted from us. And they went right after that thing, and they went after it every night till they got what they wanted. But see, we were in a little town by ourselves. We had a little grocery store and we had these people living in the houses there and there was people in back of us and our houses were all this way. There were eight rows of us and every one of them had a destruction in the ceilings except us. But I think it's because they didn't start dropping the stuff till they were beyond us and they were heading towards like a corner to the corner of the room here. That's where they were heading for the munitions factory. That's what they wanted more than anything. Do, do you remember listening on the radio to Winston Churchill? Yes, I did. Tell me about that. And then also there's other people I heard too. Uh, I, we, I liked him. My mother liked him very much. They, he, she said, and I agreed with her, because, you know, I wasn't very old to disagree with my, my mother anyway. But he made sense what he said. No, he was very steady, a good, calm person, and a, I think a very good leader in what he was doing. And I, we all believed him. I was never going to disagree him anyway because he sounded like he knew what he was talking about. And we needed somebody to follow, and he would be the one to follow. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duty. And so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say, this was their finest hour. My parents were given what they called uh, a shelter. But they're corrugated metal. There were four pieces, straight, and they're rounded at the top. They gave you bolts to put in the top. Now you have a, a, a roof like so. So my father, being the great man that he is, I don't know if he ever dug the hole. I never did know that. And the only reason I learned that story is when I watched the PBS movie on at the 1940s house. My dad would fix it up with steps down in it and I could do my homework and he had a little light, you know, and he fixed it up as well as he could because he knew I'd be in there most every night. And we lived through all of that. It, it, you can't believe it. But you see how strong we all are. Every one of us, we think, oh, I couldn't do that. But you can do anything if you just stay calm and do the best you can. Those are my mother's words. Now I have to tell you this story about my mother. My mother had a song she sang to me every day. If, that's the name of the song, if. If I can help somebody as I pass along. If I can cheer somebody with a smile or a song. If I can let somebody know they are traveling wrong, then my living has not been in vain. I have lived that whole song my whole life. I, every moment of my life has been lived up that song. If I 
somebody as I pass oh Lord if I can choose somebody with a word or song if I That he's traveling, he's traveling around in my living shall not be in vain. And come to find out that was written in 1941 for the war because it was a good good song for people to sing and cheer everybody up. Now how do you like that? Does that finish up your story? <laughs> That's amazing.